This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Just hours after the International Court of Justice in The Hague ordered Israel to take all measures to prevent genocide in Gaza, but stopped short of calling for a ceasefire, a hearing in another genocide case began here in the United States. The Center for Constitutional Rights first filed the case in November against President Joe Biden, Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. For three hours on Friday, in a federal courtroom in Oakland, California, Palestinians and Americans testified in person and by phone from Gaza about the Biden administration's failure to prevent what they called the, quote, unfolding genocide in Gaza. Lawyers for the Biden administration say the court lacks proper jurisdiction to decide the case, which they argue is a matter of foreign policy. <clears throat> the judge said, quote, this probably is the most difficult case, factually, that this court has ever had. For more, we're joined by two guests. Leila Al-Haddad is a Palestinian writer and journalist from Gaza, who testified in Court Friday, author of Gaza Mom, Palestine Politics, Parenting and Everything in Between, and co-editor of the book Gaza Unsilenced, with Rafat al the Palestinian academic and activist killed in December by an Israeli airstrike in Gaza, along with his brother, his sister and her four children. Also joining us is Diala Shamas, senior state attorney, staff attorney for the Center for Constitutional Rights. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Diala, why don't you start off by laying out the case? Thank you for having me, Amy. Yeah, so we filed this case in November, um, laying out all of the ways in which the U.S. government, this Biden administration in particular, President Biden, Secretaries Blinken and Austin, um, have failed in their duty to prevent an unfolding genocide in Gaza, but also um, are complicit in a genocide in Gaza. And um, we, a couple of days after filing our complaint, sought a preliminary injunction, which is essentially an emergency order, um, laying, saying to the court, you know, the, the stakes here are so high. The harms to our plaintiffs, the Palestinians, um, who are plaintiffs in this case, and we have um, two human rights organizations with staff in Gaza that are plaintiffs, along with a number of individuals, some of whom are Palestinian Americans with families in Gaza, many of whom have been killed and displaced and are, you know, suffering all of the conditions that we have all come to know all too well. Um, and we also have plaintiffs in Gaza, um, Palestinians who are, you know, currently displaced um, and who've also um, suffered injuries and uh, loss of relatives. Um, and and in our motion for preliminary injunction, we essentially tell the court, um, unless the court intervenes now and issues an urgent, some urgent relief, um, the, the harm to these people, these Palestinians, will be so irreparable. And so we need some urgent action pending the sort of resolution um, of the litigation, which always, of course, takes um, much longer time. And so the hearing, uh, the government filed a motion to dismiss as well as an opposition to, you know, our motion seeking that uh, urgent relief. And we had that hearing on Friday, which you were just describing, a really remarkable hearing in many ways. Um, I think in large part, you know, one of the most remarkable aspects was as far as I can tell, as far as I'm aware of, um, we've been, you know, litigating Palestine related cases and just been a student of them for decades. And um, I can't think of another time where in a U.S. federal court, Palestinians have been on the witness stand one after the other after the other describing, you know, their experiences under um, Israeli occupation uh, uninterrupted um, in a way that offers a holistic, complete and complicated accounting of what has been happening to Palestinians. And in this case, not just uh, over the course of the last 16 weeks since the latest assault and this unfolding genocide started, but um, really kind of placing it in a broader context. Uh, every single one of our um, plaintiffs got up there, and in order to explain the impact to the court, to the judge, 
um, of the current moment and Israeli calls for Nakba now had to explain um, the history of the Nakba. I've never heard the word Nakba be said in federal court so many times. And it was an important part of their telling because uh, to because they were there to they were tasked with you know describing the urgency and the harm and the injury that they are experiencing, and it is of course a multi-layered harm. And in order to explain how they even got to Gaza in the first place, they have to explain the family's history as refugee as a refugee population, the fragmentation of Palestinians. Um, so there was so much that was really remarkable about the hearing, um, but that. It really stands out to me as one of the, the and, major aspects. And Yala, if you can quickly say, how did the um, preliminary judgment of the uh, International Court of Justice in The Hague uh, weigh in uh, and inform uh, the case that you brought? Because it happened right after on Friday, as they said, Israel has to prevent a genocide in Gaza. And also the significance of the judge saying this is the most difficult case he'll ever have to decide. Yeah, so as you as you said, mere hours after the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, issued its order, we, uh, you know, it was 4 a.m. California time. Our hearing started at 9 a.m. We reviewed it as fast as we could, submitted it to the court because it was, of course, relevant um, and hadn't really had the time to fully process it. But walking into that hearing with the sort of validation in many ways, although we all, I think, knew exactly, in some ways we didn't need the validation, but that, that the international court, that the world court had found that there was you know, a plausible case of, of genocide um, that required the the order that it issued um, with the provisional measures was significant that the judge took note of it. Um, and in many ways, we're in similar postures in our in our in our federal court proceeding as that international court of justice proceeding, which is the provisional measures um, at the international court level also just sought to to get these urgent provisional measures. Um, at a showing of plausibility. So we don't have time to have the full uh, litigation on the merits because it, by the time we come around, the damage will be done and there will be nobody left to save. And so uh, that's why we, we got that order from the ICJ. Um, and we're making the similar arguments to, to the court here. We just need these, these this preliminary injunction now. Um, and then we can litigate this. Uh, I, I down want to the bring. Line. I want to bring in Leila Al Haddad. You're a Palestinian writer and journalist from Gaza. Um, <clears throat> you are the co-editor of a book with Rafat Al Arir, who was killed in Gaza only recently. Well-known, acclaimed writer and academic in Gaza. Um, you are the author of Gaza Mom: Palestine Politics, Parenting, and Everything in Between. Speaking to us, though, from the Baltimore today. What did you testify in court on Friday, Leila? Good morning. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. I and other um, plaintiffs who were, spoke in a personal capacity, not the organization of plaintiffs, about how this ongoing genocide and particularly U.S. complicity in it has impacted our, our families in Gaza and, of course, our families here as well. So I started off by <clears throat> introducing myself, excuse me, as you can see, it's been a long weekend. My voice is completely gone. Um, I spoke about my family, both in Gaza City and in the south of Gaza in Khan Yunis. And um, I started off by talking about how Israel had uh, killed multitudes of them on my mother's side. I believe the number is now 86. And um, five of my immediate family members in Gaza City and had uh, displaced the rest of them to multiple location and how Israel was responsible for <clears throat> starving them and depriving them of uh, basic human needs and, and so on, all with active U.S. support, with U.S. weapons and with U.S. financial support and with U.S. diplomatic support. 
I spoke about my aunt and my adult cousins and my cousin's wife in Gaza City. I had finally had a chance after three months to uh, get the full details from the surviving brother uh, who is now, I mean, even his whereabouts now are unknown after a heavy night of Israeli bombardment on Gaza City. But he was telling me how he um, he had to, on his own, um, retrieve um, his sister's body parts, half of his mother, because he couldn't retrieve the other half, how he had to bury them himself with his own hands in a mass grave, how his sister's body, my cousin, was still unaccounted for under the rubble, and how he himself was severely injured, and how his brother, uh, my, uh, my other cousin, bled to death because he couldn't even access uh, medical care. They couldn't get paramedics to the area. Um, so it was very heavy, very heavy and very painful, but also very urgent. And that was part of the point is to speak about how we have not had the luxury as Palestinians and particularly Palestinians from Gaza to grieve. We have not had that luxury and we recognize uh, how being Palestinians in America um, necessitates um, our, this, our involvement in this case, how it obligates us to do everything we can to take every possible recourse, including including legal recourse, to try and, and put an end to this, since it's our tax dollars who, who are um, being put to work and, and American weaponry, as I said, um, and, and so on. <clears throat> And this latest attack on Khan Yunus, as you have many family members, there are so many of the people now who are being told to leave Khan Yunus, they have moved repeatedly, um, thinking that each next place was a safe zone, now being forced to Rafah, to the border, to the sea. <clears throat> Where are your family members, and what do you hope will come out of this? They are, without exaggeration, everywhere, like like everyone else. And I and I hate to keep saying that, I, but I sometimes, not to trivialize, but I feel like you look at someone else and then you say, well, at least their situation's a little better. But truth be told, um, the entire situation is just um, beyond description, horrific. And um, every morning when I, you know, look at my feed and my WhatsApp and communicate with my family members. I try not to ask even, you know, how they're doing, but I know that they, they derive hope from knowing that we are all doing something here to speak out about what's happening. And, and that, again, was one of the main motiva motivating factors behind being involved in this lawsuit. But my family, <clears throat> several of them are actually still in Gaza City. They haven't left since the very beginning. I have um, two direct cousins there and their husbands and all of their children are um, one of them is in, in front of the uh, Nasser Hospital in Gaza City. The others are in Rimal. Uh, my one cousin was in the Shifa compound and then um, decided to go to another neighborhood in Rimal with his family. I don't even know where, on the streets somewhere, because his home was destroyed. Um, my eldest uncle, who's blind and deaf, um, with his son and family are in central Gaza, in Zawaida, near the Maghazi refugee camp. And my mother's family were in Khan Yunis, as you mentioned, and then um, um, are now in Mawasi. Uh, and so I haven't been able to communicate them with them in, for a while, but one of the cousins I was, and her home in Garada was destroyed, and she's now with her four children, um, literally under a nylon tarp, because they couldn't even find a tent, and her husband, um, who has cancer. And um, yeah, as it's, it's a little, I mean, for those who aren't familiar, Mawasi is literally a sandy enclave, almost like sand dunes, directly uh, adjacent to the beach, so there's, I mean, there's nothing there um, beyond the seawater and and whatever tents you might have access to. And now, of course, with uh, aid being cut by by several countries, including the United States, which, as it's been said, uh, Blinken did not hesitate within a matter of seconds to shut that aid off. And yet, for more than three months, uh, Palestinians have been enduring an ongoing genocide, uh, which the United States not only has refused to stop, but is actively aiding and abetting. Uh, and despite overwhelming evidence, including, you know, President Biden himself acknowledging the attacks have been discriminated or some of the bombings have been discriminated, um, despite overwhelming evidence about, despite the intent and by stated intent by Israeli leaders, um, that th there are no innocents in Gaza, that this was intended to make Gaza unlivable, Layla. still has not. 
and did that. <clears throat> We're going to talk about that cutting off of aid to UNRWA in our next segment. I want to thank you so much for being with us, Leila Haddad, Palestinian writer, journalist from Gaza, and Yala Shemis, a senior staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights.